And welcome to Columbia University. My name is Kendall Thomas, and I am the Nash Professor of Law here at Columbia Law School, and the Center for uh, the Director of the Center for the Study of Law and Culture. And and here this afternoon, in my capacity as a former member of the working group. Uh, the Reframing Gender Violence Working Group of the Center for the Study of Social Difference. And I'd like to say a few words about the Center. Uh, this today is the last, today and tomorrow, the last um, public workshop in an extraordinary series that was birthed uh, by the Center for the Study of Social Difference called Reframing Gender Violence. And this project is at the heart of the work that the Center for the Study of Social Difference does. It's an interdisciplinary research center here at Columbia that supports collaborative projects that address gender, race, sexuality, and other forms of inequality with an eye to fostering ethical and progressive social change. CSSD has brought together arts and sciences faculty uh, into conversation with faculty from Columbia's professional schools and global centers along with scholars, artists, writers, and policymakers in the United States and uh, abroad. And we are particularly fortunate to have uh, two of our visionary colleagues, uh, without whom I certainly wouldn't be here today, and without whom the center would not exist. Um, and that's Professor Mariana Hirsch um, and Professor Lila Abulugo, who are both here with us. The Reframing Gendered Violence series was created with the support of former Columbia University Dean of Humanities, Professor Sharon Marcus. We'd like to thank the number of organizations uh, and groups that have contributed to this two-day gathering as co-sponsors. Thanks to the Queer Theory Working Group at the Center for the Study of Social Difference. Thank you to the Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality. Thanks to the Just Societies Initiative, to the Center for Gender and Sexuality Law, and to the Fellows and the Heyman Center uh, for the Humanities. I'd like to extend a special thank you in my personal capacity uh, to several individuals who have made this logistically possible. Uh, thanks to Liz Boylan, uh, who is the coordinator for the Center for Gender and Sexuality Law. Thanks to Megan Chia, who's my assistant and is also the coordinator for the Center for the Study of Law and Culture. And a big, huge thanks to Catherine Lasota, um, who is the administrative coordinator for the Center for the study of social difference. Uh, without these three folks, none of this would have happened because this was, just a few hours ago, an empty room. Um, so not only uh, do we owe them a special debt for getting you here, but for getting everything that we need in the room here. Um, I'd also like to thank the CSSD program coordinator, Aya Eldosugi, and the CSSD graduate students and work uh, study students for their invaluable help in pulling these two days together. Um, I, some months ago, um, wrote a letter uh, to several of the people who are here today and to a few others um, who I hope to be would be here today who are not here, uh, in which I tried to set out what I thought 
our conversations today and tomorrow might do uh, as contributions to this ongoing initiative on reframing gendered violence. I thought it was particularly important that at least one of these gatherings uh, be devoted to addressing in its specificity the question of violence against trans folks. And I wanted it to be a conversation that brought a lot of different folks together in the same room. The cultural dominant, as anyone who's organized a conference in the last decade or so will know, is um, to tightly curate and even uh, to script conferences, leaving no empty space uh, for silence, for reflection, for rethinking, for productive hesitation. And I want to begin by saying that that is most emphatically not this space. Uh, we want open space. We want to make sure that there are moments, uh, gaps, fissures, opportunities uh, for interventions in and around each of the questions that will be raised over the course of the next couple of days. Um, it's a working conference or something that inhabits the space between a workshop and a conference. You will notice uh, that we are recording the proceedings with an eye to having a written record of the conversation uh, that can go out into the archive of conversations and become, we hope, an opportunity for productive work, both scholarly work uh, and for activism around issues of transgender justice. So the transversal of the workshop conference format is, from my perspective, an important one. Our goal is to try to stage as capacious a platform and as inclusive a conversation as possible. Realizing that not everybody is in the room um, and that not everybody is on the program. But we hope that you will all consider yourselves partners uh, in the conversation that we will be having over the course of the next few days. Regardless of where you've come here from, universities, colleges, whether you're independent scholars, whether you're working within, across, or across, against multiple disciplines and areas of research, uh, whether you're community-based activists, or whether you're all of those things at once, uh, realizing that the categories are not mutually exclusive. Our hope is to offer an opportunity for interventions and discussions that reflect the varieties of transgender identities, expression, and experience across a range of cultural, linguistic, national, regional, and global contexts. Although the specific focus of the two days is on the question of transgender violence, one central thread of the production, of the discussion, rather, is to promote connection, consideration, and conversation about the ways in which work on an activism around transgender violence uh, can open up, indeed, demands reconsideration and reframing of issues of gendered violence as such. Um, I've been working over the, the past few days on an essay that's going to appear in a forthcoming issue of the journal Critical Analysis of Law. Uh, Professor Joseph Fischel is editing it, and it's on the topic of queer legal theory. And I've had the benefit of being able to read the contributions to the volume, one of which is an extraordinary conversation uh, between Professor Paisley Curra and Professor A.L. Gross. And there's a moment in that conversation um, which I found really arresting. Uh, Paisley's talking about the relationship between queer and trans, um, and he references specifically the question of violence, transgender violence against women, and this is what he had to say. Um, violence against transgender women and the victims of this violence are di disproportionately women of color, 
gets packaged as violence against transgender people. There's nothing wrong with using a trans versus cis frame to show that trans people are more likely to be victims of violence. But violence against trans women should also be seen as driven by misogyny. It's women who are disproportionately affected by this violence, which is overwhelmingly intimate in nature. The continuities between trans women and cis women drop out of the picture, and that inhibits our ability to develop effective responses. So um, I can't be clearer than Paisley. I think you know um, from this excerpt where uh, he's going uh, in trying to insist on a conceptual frame that can connect specifically violence against trans women as trans as women and violence against cis women. Um, but in reframing the question of transgender violence, it occurs to me that there are, from this starting point even, uh, a number of questions that proliferate. Um, so, for example, I thought that trans women, trans women of color, um, have also been targeted um, for violence um, because of their perceived refusal, betrayal, or resistance to manhood and masculinity. Race notions of, normatively race notions of manhood and masculinity. Um, but we also have reason, I think, to, to ask whether the reason for looking at violence against trans women is simply about uh, redressing a perceived exclusion or absence of trans women from womanhood. This connects to the question of reframing gender violence. Um, I'm thinking here of the extraordinary book um, by Sarah Haley, which looks at the experience of black women in the Georgia penal system, No Mercy Here, in which she says that she's looking at this archive of work not simply to put black women in the history of womanhood, but to show the ways in which gender is fundamentally race and that we cannot understand gender apart from or outside of race. So the project is more radical and more fundamental than simply thinking additively. Right? Let's add trans women to the list of women who are targets for uh, gendered violence. Might the question we want to consider then uh, in thinking about uh, whether and if so how cis B, uh, might the question we might want to consider then be um, whether and if so how cisgender womanhood it is constructed in and in relationship to transgender womanhood and the ways in which, which both uh, transgender womanhood and cisgender womanhood are constructed in and in relationship to normative cisgender manhood and masculinities. Uh, normative conceptions of manhood and masculinities which require violence against women. Gender violence against women, from this perspective, is always also a site for the production of stable cisgendered manhood. So in talking about transgender violence, um, gender violence against transgender people, we want to bring gender as such into the room um, and look at the ways in which gender can be understood looking specifically at the experience of transgender violence as an architecture of violence. Um, we also need to push back against the liberal notion of gendered violence as a kind of an exception or an aberration from an otherwise nonviolent norm. To what extent does the experience of transgender people and of transgendered violence open up um, opportunities indeed demand an analysis of the ways in which violence is at the very heart of the way we think even in liberal societies and live uh, gender. Uh, so transgender here comes to be understood to quote Hortense Spillers as a kind of vestibule of absolute difference which ramifies and refracts in a number of directions at once uh, which is of course about the lives of transgendered people, uh, but which also resonates in a powerful way, um, spills over, uh, and demands that we look at other kinds of gender uh, identities 
other kinds of gendered existence um, through the lens of violence in fresh uh, and different ways. And we're really, really fortunate uh, to have an extraordinary collection of people who are going to help us over the course of the next few days uh, do precisely that. Um, it's my honor then to introduce uh, the moderator of our first panel, um, Jennifer Boylan, who is the Anna Quinlan Writer in Residence at Barnard College, uh, a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, whose work I'm sure uh, many of you uh, in the room have read as I have uh, to great benefit, uh, and is a member of the Board of Trustees of Penn America. Um, Jennifer, the floor, the table, the, the room um, is yours, but I want to thank you all uh, before we start um, again for being here, and it's been an honor for me to have an opportunity um, to work on conceptualizing and pulling this um, event together. Uh, but let's get to work. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. And can I just ask you one thing? Did you say Professor Abulaba? Abulaba. Why? Is she in the room? Yes. Oh, you're not Pina Abulaba. No, Professor oh. Pina. Okay. <laughs> Another professor, old friend. I thought I was going to see her for the first time in 40 years. <laughs> Good family, though. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for, for, for coming. Thank you for, um, thank you for being here, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this remarkable event. Um, uh, I'm Jenny Boyle. I'm from the English Department uh, of Barnard College, and it is my pleasure to further welcome you to this opening event in our conference. We're going to hear two presentations from our two distinguished guests today and then open this up for a conversation between them and you about the violence against trans people and where we all go from here. Um, it seems proper before I introduce them just um, um, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this topic um, is more than uh, um, a... <clears throat> a scholarly uh, subject of, of um, abstraction for many of us in this room. Uh, when we talk about um, transgender violence, we're talking about something that many of the people in this room have experienced firsthand. So um, <coughs> that shouldn't uh, change anything that anybody says, but I, I, I think it's proper to begin with them by acknowledging that. Uh, we're, not, we're, we're talking about something very real. Um, and um, if you're a trans person who's been on the receiving end of violence, um, this may be a difficult conversation to hear. Um, I hope that other people um, will be aware of that, um, and if we need to pause for a moment mid-conversation uh, just to kind of catch our breath and to make sure everybody knows that they're um, safe and sound and loved, um, even here at Columbia University, we can try to Try to make sure you feel <laughs> that way. Okay. Um, also, uh, just um, on the set, um, for the sake of housekeeping, all of your your, your two speakers and I use female pronouns. Um, oh, and this is clever. Also, your moderator, that's me, uh, is deaf uh, or nearly. So if I if I um, I can generally um, hear because of my space age hearing aids, and also if I can see your 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 lips moving. Um, if anybody is trying to say something and I'm not acknowledging you, just raise your hand and wave. Or even better, just stand up and jump, jump right in. Okay, is that enough? Okay. So I guess I'm just trying to say, if, I, if, I, if I'm not acknowledging you, it's, I'm not, I'm not trying to be rude. At least not on purpose. Okay. Let's meet our two visiting scholars, Asla Zengen and Catherine Kloon Taylor. First, Professor Zengen, whose talk is entitled. Belonging in Death, Transgender Funerals, Family, Islam, and Gender Politics in Turkey. She is the Louise Lamphere Visiting Assistant Professor in the Department of Anthropology and the Pembroke Center at Brown University. Before joining Brown, she held postdoctoral fellowships in the Women's Studies and Religion Program at Harvard Divinity School. 
and the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program at Brown University. Her, f- <coughs> excuse me, her first book, Intimacy of Power, Women, Prostitutes, Sex, Work, and Violence in Istanbul, was published in Turkish. In that book, she examined the regulation of licensed and unlicensed sex work at the intersection of state power, law, medicine, and violence. Currently, she's completing her second book, The Trouble with Ambiguity, the State, Islam, Family, and Transgender Embodiment in Contemporary Turkey. She's widely published in edited volumes, peer-reviewed journals, including Cultural Anthropology, Pathologica, the Journal of Middle East Women's Studies, and the Transgender Studies Quarter. Her research lies at the intersection of ethnography of gender non-conforming lives and deaths, Islamic and medical legal regimes of sex, gender, and sexuality, critical studies of violence and sovereignty, as well as transnational aspects of LGBTQ movements in the Middle East with a special focus on Turkey. And this is Catherine Kuhn Taylor. (coughs) She was a little reluctant to pin down her talk with the title, but she said if she absolutely had to, she'd call it Unruly Emergence, Gender, Bodies, and Immutable Biological Traits. She's postdoctoral research associate in the program in Gender and Sexuality Studies at Princeton. She's published in FANX, Journal of Existential and Phenomenological Theory and Culture, and the American Journal of Public Health. And, while waiting for reviewers' comments on a few other articles, is currently revising her doctoral project for publication as a book entitled Securing Cisgendered Futures, Managing Intersex as Disorders of Sex Development. In this interdisciplinary project, Kuhn Taylor critically explores ethics, biopolitics, and clinical research underwriting the controversial new treatment model for intersex conditions introduced in 2006, as well as other medical practices which aim to secure a cisgender future for a minor, such as the treatment of trans kids with so-called conversion therapies. Further, she has also begun research for her next book-length project, tentatively entitled the matter of black life and death, race, biopolitics, and the American health insurance market. In fall 2019, she will take up the position of assistant professor of feminist science and technology studies in the Department of Women's Studies at San Diego State University. She's currently the president of the Canadian Society of Women in Philosopher. Let's welcome them. We are going to begin with Professor Zengen, I believe. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Jenny. Um, okay. Thank you, Jenny, for the generous introduction. And I want to thank you. Can I hang on? Let's make sure you don't like this on. on. It's on. Just put it up. Let's just go like that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas, to, uh, for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be part of this great conversation. I'm looking forward to tonight's discussion and tomorrow's conversation. And thank you all for coming here today. So I'm just going to start presenting my piece. It was a bright, sunny day. I reached the mosque for Sebastian's funeral at around noon. There was a big crowd of trans women gathered in the narrow street surrounding the mosque. Traditionally, women attendees of Muslim funerals wait for the obsequy either outside the mosque or in the family home of the deceased. But in Sibas' case, like many other trans people's cases, the family home was a complicated issue. The funeral crowd, mostly composed of Sibas' trans friends and not immediate family, clustered on the street, replacing her blood family. Sibas had a cerebral hemorrhage a few days prior while she was soliciting at night. She was a close friend to many trans women in Istanbul LGBTT, a trans majority LGBTQ organization, and one of my primary research sites. After her immediate hospitalization, trans people from Istanbul LGBTT started to visit and care for her, taking turns to do so. Abandonment by the black family is a common story among trans women in Turkey, and Sibel was one of them. Her trans friends, were the ones to inform her blood family about her situation, though the family paid little attention to Spell as she stayed in the hospital. After a few days, Spell passed away. 
Sabahid identified and lived her life as a woman. However, she was a male citizen in the eyes of the state and hence had a blue ID card, the color that the state issues to its male citizens in Turkey. Had she completed her official gender transition, which is a medical, medical, medical legal process that approximately takes for three years, she could have been holding a pink ID card and officially recognized as female at the moment of her death. She had had pop surgery yet still had a penis, a bodily configuration that transgressed the strict gender binary institutional categories of female and male. When it came to her funeral ceremony and burial ritual, her body invoked a crisis of legibility, opening gender and sexual difference to debates and negotiations by a variety of social actors. It was not merely Sval's blood family members and the state's medical legal actors from the Department of Funeral and Cemetery Services, but also religious authorities, particularly imams, who started to discuss Sval's real sex and gender. Sibal's sex gender transgressive body became a source of multiple interpretations and inscriptions of the very categories of female, male, and women, man. Sibal's friends from the LGBTQ activist community were also part of these negotiations, challenging some of these claims and advocating for Sibal to be more as female women. Sex gender non-conforming deaths constitute a contentious social field in and through which sex and gender is debated by several actors. As Sibas funeral demonstrates, medical legal actors, imams, family members, friends of the deceased, and the LGBTQ activists in Turkey evince diverse sovereign claims on the sex, gender, and ownership of the deceased body. In order to understand the reasons for such perplexities of gender ambiguity, I situate sex gender nonconformity within a social framework that is formed through entanglements between Islamic notions of embodiment, familial order, gender and sexual regimes, and legal regulations around that in Turkey. Portraying the associations between these multiple sovereign claims, I will show how sex gender nonconforming deaths form and shape collusions, as well as intimate alliances among Islam, the family, the state, and the LGBTQ community in Turkey. Through the funerals of transgender women, sexual and gender difference also marks the limits of belonging in each world and in practices of mourning and grief. Now I would like to provide you with some context on the religious and cultural embodiment of sex and gender in Turkey. The popular interpretation of Islam in Turkey commands that people's bodies come from and belong to Allah. In that sense, the body is Allah's emanet to humans, that is, Allah entrusts it to humans for their life course, and hence humans are responsible for taking good care of it until returning it upon their death. The ritual of washing, shrouding, burying, and praying for the body at funeral, funerals represent a significant part of this body logic, ensuring the return of the body to Allah as clean and pure as possible, as a reflection of the way in which it is held in trust. Mainly the deceased family, blood, blood family members are obliged to practice these rituals for showing the last respects to the deceased and preparing the body for the afterlife. The birth family, as the primary holder of obligations and rights to the deceased is also inscribed in the domain of law through regulations around death and inheritance. This position allows the family also to lay sovereign claims on the representation of the deceased sex and gender at funerals. Display of strict gender dynamics as Islamic funeral practices not only reaffirm the deceased belonging in the family, but they also represent the bodies belonging in a given sex gender category. The coffin design, the prayers at the mosque, the washing ritual prior to funeral, and the rites of burial differ according with the state's manifestation of sex in the ID cards of Turkish citizens. For example, only the officially trained ritual specialists and family members of the same sex as the deceased can enter the special washing place, Gassinhane, and practice the washing ritual. During the ritual washing, the body part between the belly and the knees are covered. The genitals should not be exposed while cleaning the body. After the washing, the body is then shrouded in a simple white cloth, 
kefen, which symbolizes the equality for all before God. The face should not be exposed after shrouding. Kefan is made of three pieces for men and five pieces for women. Prior to burial, the white shrouded body is placed in a coffin with a green covering on which verses about death from Quran are printed. This is decorated with a public marker of gender identity using a headscarf on the side of the coffin over the location of the head if the deceased is a female and nothing if the deceased is, is a male. And you can see the headscarf on one end of the coffin, so this is a female funeral. The Imam's prayers address the deceased as marhume or marhum or hautin kish or arkish, which link the deceased to female or male sex respectively. This is really important because Turkish is gender neutral, so we use the same gender pronoun for um, human, non-human subjects and objects altogether. We have only one gender pronoun. But in the moment of the, at the moment of the, the iteration of this gender difference is uh, important to pay attention because it's this, um, prayers are derived from Arabic. And Arabic has a particular gendering uh, aspect. Upon the completion of prayers, the dead body is carried to the graveyard, taken out of the coffin and buried simply in the white shroud by men. As a general religious rule, only men are allowed to be present around the graveyard during the burial, regardless of the gender of the deceased. Women are usually expected to either stand in the background or stay home. Given the strict organization of gender dichotomy in the Sunni Islamic funeral practices, it is no surprise that Gender non-conforming bodies, including sivas, might easily invoke puzzlement. Those people who follow popular Sunni interpretations of Islam might view the sex-gender transgressive body as having challenged the Islamic notions of embodiment, that is Allah's ascription of sex and configuration of the body. Imams might easily refuse to organize a ceremony once they discover the deceased is a transgender person, either immediately refusing to do the prayers or consenting only if the transgender person is the designated, the sex assigned at birth. In fact, similar problems took place at Sibas' funeral, while her friends were trying to find the mosque to arrange the ceremony. Jada, a 50-year-old trans woman and a close friend to Sibel, told me how it had been difficult to find the mosque to do the funeral and prayers for Sibel, since most of the Imams rejected organizing the ceremony once they discovered that the sis was a trans woman. Some Imams had refused to do the prayers right away and denied religious rights to a sex gender transgressive deceased body. A few others had consented to do it as long as Sibel was referred to as a male during the prayers. They had recognized the blue ID, the state's inscription of sex, as the one and only true sex, dismissing Sibel's self-identified life, accounts as a woman. Sibel's friends didn't accept this option and kept looking for another imam who did agree to conduct her funeral ceremony that is according to Islamic norms and codes and without denying her self-ascribed female identity. In practice, there is not a unified and homogeneous Sunni Islamic reading of the sex gender non-conforming body. Sex gender transgression is open to negotiation and debated by religious authorities, indicating multiple interpretations within Islam regarding issues of sex and gender embodiment. The family or the friends of the deceased may succeed in persuading the religious authorities to perform the funeral practices pertinent to the deceased's lived gender and sex. Also, my interviews with imams reveal that imams use their incentives and insights by resorting to their role in interfering in other religious ambiguous issues. For example, the ambiguity is at stake with the dead bodies of Hunsa, intersex people. Or suicide is another example. If you want to talk about it, we can just talk about it during the training. In most cases, the state-issued gender identity is seen as the principal criterion to perform the gender practice of funeral rituals. According to the Islamic jurisprudence, if there is still vagueness with the lack or simultaneous presence of male, female sexual organs, then the imam might prefer to learn how the person identified in their lifetime. In case this information is impossible to acquire, then the imam would act accordingly to the testimonies and assessments of those who knew the disease in life. Their washing ritual is practiced by neither women nor men. 
Ideally, a person wraps her or his or their hand with a piece of cloth and cleans their face and arms only. Similar ambiguities took place at Sibas funeral ceremony and burial. Sibas France eventually found an imam who accepted to practice her funeral and burial rituals according to Sibas self-identified gender. At the funeral, I paid great attention to how Sibas gender would be addressed in the prayers. However, I did not need to wait for the imam's prayers to figure this out. I saw the coffin, which was covered in a green pole with a headscarf placed on one side where the person had would rest. The imam of this mosque had recognized Sibat as a female woman. Yet a singularly religion-based approach to perplexities of gender ambiguity is insufficient. As I mentioned earlier, family plays a significant role in the organization of Islamic rituals of death, practices of mourning, and discourses of grief in Turkey. However, according to Jada, many trans women were buried without their family's enactments of these religious and social practices. For example, with Sibel's death, the trouble was not only the aforementioned search for a mosque, but also the washing ritual and securing a grave in the cemetery. The main question had become how to and who should organize the funeral rituals and material resources for the burial. Sibel's blood mother and sister were present at the funeral, but they chose not to take any role in the washing ritual. They reproduced a distance from Sibel's dead body through withholding dead rights and the affective, social, and kinship effects these rights are meant to produce. Instead of Sibel's family members, Jada had done the ritual washing of Sibel's body. She also recalled how many times she had to wash clean and wrap the dead bodies of her trans friends since many families had completely abandoned their trans children and did not want to touch their bodies. But there is also an alternative story of this family relations. There is a small group of family members who are organizing uh, around gender and sexual rights for their LGBTQ kids. Uh, we can also talk about this uh, political organizing during the family. Familial abandonment showed itself not only when trans women are alive, but also when they die. The black family may deny funerals or rituals of death to their trans children, strictly marking the limits of trans people's belonging in the family. In such occurrences, however, the LGBTQ community may step in reclaim the funeral rights and the ownership of the deceased body. They often take the initiative, reclaim the body and organize the funeral, replacing the family, announcing themselves as the real family. This is what happened at morning ritual following Sibad's burial, which was held at Istanbul Legia Beta When I entered the room, I saw approximately 10 pairs of shoes that were lined up next to one another on the floor, ranging in colors and in wear. The shoes were now waiting to embrace new feet and carry new bodies, a practice that has become tradition within the trans community. When a trans woman from the community dies, trans collect objects and belongings from her house and exhibit for people to take according to their needs and preferences. This redistribution of resources, or perhaps this intimate gift economy of the dead, is yet another way of community of trans women proclaims itself a family. Someone made halwa, a dessert traditionally cooked and served by the deceased family to the participants of the funeral following the interment. Sibel's blood family was absent at this ritual as well, nor had they gone to the cemetery for the internment. Her mother and sister asked Jada to tell other trans women not to come to visit them in their homes to give their condolences. They would not welcome them inside the house. I also found out that the burial plot was bought with money pulled by trans women. Sibel's blood family had contributed nothing. This was not the first time they pulled their resources for a deceased friend they did the same thing for many other trans women who had died disowned by their blood families. When Jada saw that I was impressed, she turned to me and said, when I die, they are going to do the same thing. After all, we are each other's family. We are the family. Following Sibel's funeral, I spent the entire day with Jada. As our conversations continued, she began to recount a different story of gender nonconformity this time one where their efforts to reclaim the deceased body of yet another trans friend, Aisha, failed. The black family did not let them organize a funeral. This other family had disavowed their trans daughter, both in her life and in her death, 
and had requested that the state bury Aisha in a cemetery for the anonymous. Although Jada and her friends had made claims, claims to be Aisha's real family and raised funds to buy a burial plot and inter her at a cemetery for the, the known, the Black family had insisted on her burial among anonymous people. Mm. Jada and her friends could do nothing. They were legally denied on the grounds of lacking blood or intimate ties to the disease, despite the fact that they had cared for her for years. This negation of intimacy was possible because the state inscribes intimacy as a family asset bound by blood and assigns the blood family members as the only legal intimate actors to have rights over the trans person's body. In the absence of a will or a marriage, the blood family is the only actor to inherit the property that is left behind the deceased. So trans women told stories about some black families who did not hesitate to deny funeral rights to their trans children, but at the same time claim their wealth. The family's refusal of the obligation of intimacy in Aisha's incident was not just an act that broke ties with the black family and the trans child. By not allowing Aisha a burial ceremony organized by her trans friends, they also sought to destroy trans intimacies, obligations, and relations. The state's sustenance of a dominant intimate order in Turkey strictly depends on the circulation and cultivation of desires for heteroproductive family life. This family model is the only legal recognized organization of intimacy in Turkey and forecloses alternative ties of relatedness. The trans people's sovereign claims over their intimate relations with their friends and their bodies are strongly contested, negotiated, and shaped at the intersection of those legal regulations institutional practices, and norms that inscribe heteroproductive nuclear family as the hegemonic model of intimacy in Turkey. Sibel's funeral shows how her <coughs> trans friends claims on her deceased body were constantly mediated through the heteronormative family and the state. In Aisha's case, her friends claims on her body were completely denied due to the legal agreement between the blood family and the state. Hence, it's crucial to pay more attention to the role of the state as the mediator and authorizer of particular forms of intimacies between trans people, their blood families, and other social actors, and of the limits of sovereignty that trans people claim over their intimate bonds and definitions of sex and gender. Especially at LGBTQ funerals, we discover intimate legal alliances established between families, religious authorities, and the state, Alliances that might invalidate the intimate claims that LGBTQ people make over each other. Paul Farmer calls for work that not only relies on conversations with the living, but also looks at the dead and those left for dead. Death forms and shapes how trans people engage with the world, as well as how they relate to one another through their creative work of living. Death at the threshold of dominant sexual and gender regimes is never an ending, but rather an initiation into intimate and violent afterlives. In these afterlives, I have suggested that the LGBTQ community and the friends of the deceased produce sovereign claims through practices of care and love towards a sex-gender transgressive death. Transgender women deploy the family as a sovereign form of intimacy, but strategically rework it through queer alignment. They contest intimate sovereign alliances between the state, Islam, and black family, and thus survive their disowning and abandonment. That and its afterlives become vital to how trans people relate to one another and the society at large, including their relationships with religious authorities, through their uh, creative work of living. Trans people turn that into ways of becoming polit political and intimate subjects, remaking the conditions of their living. The contestation over who provide meaning to ritual is a struggle over futures for trans queer social words and vitalism. The queer family intervenes and ruptures the ritual domain of religious and cultural practice, transgressing multiple sovereign arrangements of sexuality, sex, gender, kinship, and citizenship. Caring for the dead in these political and social projects becomes an emergent form of sovereignty that immigrates life in an intimate way. Thank you.
profound act of scholarship and, and as well as uh, profoundly touching um, and, and difficult emotionally, at least certainly for me to listen to. Um, in this country, um, what, what struck me in so many ways is how um, the culture is different, uh, the dominant um, religion is different, but so many of the things you mentioned taking place in Turkey are things that I've experienced firsthand. I can't tell you how many funerals I've been to where there was one funeral in the morning uh, where the body of, of someone that I knew was buried um, and the family buried that person as, as male and then the transgender sisters and the family and brothers as well, I should say, um, joined together um, uh, at a different um, ceremony um, and um, it, it, the, the, the profound sadness and anger that you feel um, and yet also the sense of love um, and solidarity you feel when your community joins together to, um, to honor the person that we've lost and that we've loved. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's very hard, and uh, um, it's often, especially when people are in that liminal state. But the liminal state is not only, of course, the body. The liminal state has to do with your relationship between your your family of origin and um, and the, and, the, and the, the the church or the mosque or wherever wherever whatever you happen to, to belong to. Um, uh, I remember going to a, a Catholic funeral of a, of a friend of mine, a cisgender man, um, actually the guy who gave me my first job uh, as an English professor. Um, and uh, I was one of his closest friends, and they had, I guess, eight ball bearers, and uh, he had had a lot of difficulty with me as a transgender person, but he, he kind of got his mind around it. And at the end, um, I was not allowed to be one of the, one of the ball bearers um, because... Um, in in the Catholic that particular Catholic tradition, only men could be could be pallbearers, and so it was this strange sense of acceptance that I was being accepted by my by my dead friend as a woman by being excluded uh, from that moment. Anyway, um, thank you very much. Um, let's um, hear from Catherine. Um, and give you the floor. Give my talk. I suppose there are questions. We'll do questions. Um, we'll take the questions ready. after. Yeah, let's do yeah. the questions yeah. together. We might have. It might, it, I think it'll be more um, productive. So take it away. And thank you. Great. Um, <coughs> so thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here today uh, to be able to be in conversation with such a phenomenal. Nice. Can you just turn it a little oh, closer? Okay. Yes, tip it up. Hello. Better? Tip it. That's better? better. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, in October 2018, the New York Times reported on a memo obtained from the Department of Health and Human Services arguing for the establishment of a legal definition of sex under Title IX in an attempt to roll back protections for trans individuals under federal civil rights law. The article, whose title declared that, quote, transgender people could be defined out of existence, end quote, under the current administration, outlined the department's arguments within the memo that gave key government agencies, uh, that key government agencies needed to adopt an explicit and uniform definition of both sex and gender. Sex, the memo proposed, would refer to, quote, a person's status as male or female based on immutable biological traits, identifiable by or before birth, end quote, and that, quote, the sex listed on a person's birth certificate as originally issued shall constitute definitive proof of a person's sex unless rebutted by reliable genetic information, end quote. Further, gender would be defined as determined, quote, on a biological basis that is clear, grounded in science, objective, and administratable, end quote. 
The memo is one part of a larger suite of administrative, legal, and rhetorical actions taken by the current administration against trans and gender non-conforming people in its boldly eugenic project of killing and letting die. While trans activists and their allies rightly asserted that trans lives would not and cannot be erased uh, via administrative redefinitions, no matter what the current administration and its cronies might like to think, it is nonetheless clear that the administration aims to make trans and gender non-conforming lives unlivable <coughs> legally, politically, socially, economically, and practically. Protests were mobilized, petitions and public statements quickly emerged in response to the memo, decrying the administration's attempt to strip trans individuals of their rights, particularly on the basis of such faulty logic. A public statement representing more than 50 companies, including Google, Apple, Nike, Microsoft, and Facebook, asserted, quote, transgender people are our beloved family members and friends and our valued team members. What harms transgender people harms our companies, end quote. These companies, who most reported commented, generated a combined $2.4 trillion U.S. in annual revenue, made clear, quote, Diversity and inclusion are good for business, end quote. Further, a letter, t a letter titled, quote, Transgender, Intersex, and Gender Nonconforming People Won't Be Erased by Pseudoscience, and signed, end quote, and signed by 200, two, sorry, 2,617 scientists and other experts in the field of science, uh, in the field of science of sex, gender, and sexuality, including myself, condemned the administration's move and the folly of its hope that disputes regarding sex and or gender could be clarified by genetic testing, stating, quote, this proposal is fundamentally inconsistent not only with science, but also with pract ethical practices, human rights, and basic dignities, end quote. Drawing on the examples of those with intersex conditions whose bodies naturally challenge biomedical definitions of discrete male and female sexes, as well as neuroanatomical evidence from <coughs> studies based on brain organization theory indicating, quote, the existence and validity of a distinct gender identity, end quote, in trans folks. The letter argues that the administration's proposal is in no way grounded in science, as claimed. It continues stating, quote, the relationship between sex chromosomes, genitalia, and gender identity is complex and not fully understood. There are no genetic tests that can unambiguously determine gender or even sex. Furthermore, even if such tests exist, it would be unconscionable to use the pretext of science to enact policies that overrule the lived experiences of people's own gender identities." End quote. Despite this negative response from who we might call captains of industry, or at the very least, the HR departments at these companies, <laughs> and those who might be deemed, like myself, experts regarding the science, the administration remains firmly entrenched within and continues to move forward with its project of eliminating trans, intersex, and other gen gender nonconforming lives rendering them not only illegitimate and unintelligible, but ultimately untenable. Further, this is only a part of a larger biopolitical biopolit project, or rather necropolitical project, clearly aimed at rendering multiple forms of life unlivable, be they black lives, brown lives, Latinx lives, immigrant lives, poor lives, disabled lives, etc in the service of an unabashedly heterosexist, transphobic, ableist, and white supremacist vision of a future nation state. However, to leave our reading of this memo and these responses to it is to miss the irony underwriting both the corporate and medico-scientific responses to it in particular, the claiming of trans folks as kin, and the instrumentalization of trans lives as good for business, by companies like Apple, Amazon, and Facebook, obscures the ways in which these companies contribute to the constitution of marginalized as marginal under capitalism. It ignores the central and complex role of capitalism within the historical constitution of sex and gender 
as well as the importance of course and norms regarding sex and gender to the expansion of capitalism itself. It obfuscates the ways in which the normalization of, market based, uh, of a market-based system of health insurance tied to employment disables trans, intersex, and other non -gender, or gender non-conforming individuals by a lack of or inadequate access to competent medical care. Further, it ignores the ways in which some of those very same companies mined and profited off the data of millions of Americans, facilitating a compromised election which brought us the memo itself. <laughs> Beyond this, however, leaving our reading of these responses here would fail to situate the scientific defense of trans, intersex, and gender non-conforming lives in particular within the historical and contemporary constitution of such lives as a problem for biomedicine and its associated fields of scientific research to solve. Indeed, while the letter is quite <coughs> right that sex, right here in the letter as, as sex chromosomes, genitalia and gender are complex and not fully understood, much research is currently being done to understand them in their complexity. This research is not merely done for the sake of understanding itself. Indeed, the overwhelming weight of our biopolitical investment in sex and gender, binary or otherwise, is brutally clear. Rather, we seek to make sense of the quote unquote abnormally or atypically sex or gender in order to make them normalizable. That is, to fold them into the normal either via a natural variation account. For example, look, trans folks have different brains, so it is normal for them to be trans. Or, via reliable forms of gender prediction and practical normalization, so as to produce lives that pass as typically conforming cisgendered ones. This is made clear when we consider the medical treatment of and production of knowledge about intersex and trans kids. In my own research, I argue that the aim of the medical management of intersex conditions is to secure a cisgendered future for the patient. By cisgendered future, I mean something far more expansive than one in which uh, an individual identifies with the sex that they were assigned at birth. Rather, I use the term to refer to a normalized trajectory of development across the lifespan in which multiple sex, gender, and sexual characteristics remain in dynamic but coherent alignment. These variables include primary sex characteristics, usually external genitalia, secondary char sex characteristics from the development of breasts to sex typical fat distribution and hair growth patterns, uh, gender characteristics including identity, behavior or role, patterns of cognition, non-sexual gender desires like toy and occupation preference, as well as sexuality. I use the term cisgender rather than cisgender specifically to, one, differentiate my critical description from one's self-identification as cisgender, transgender, non-binary, etc. And two, to emphasize the discursive and material constitution of this tra trajectory of development as cisgender, the way it is formed as such, via the treatment model itself, insofar as it assumes the normative and descriptive normalcy of cisgendered lives, and material norm materially normalizes individuals on the basis of that assumption. The treatment of an intersex infant generally involves attempting to predict their future gender in terms of identity, behavior, and presentation on the basis of our dominant biomedical theory of gender development, which is currently um, a theory known as brain organization theory, which says that brains are fixed in masculine or feminine patterns based on hormone ex exposure, usually specifically in, in utero, but throughout the lifespan. And so we use that model in conjunction with the kind of physical traits of the infant, an attempt to uh, make this prediction. Then clinicians uh, surgically assign sex on the basis of this gender prediction via cosmetic genital surgeries and sterilizing godanectomies so that the resultant life is a typically cisgendered one. The treatment of trans kids similarly aims at either securing a cisgendered future for the trans child, either via so-called conversion therapies, or one which can pass as such by the administration of puberty blockers and hormone replacement therapies. 
I would be remiss in failing to acknowledge the importance of passing as cis for many trans and non gender nonconforming individuals to not only their socially and materially surviving, but thriving, as well as fulfilling their own personal desires. And further, I want to make clear my position that individuals should have access to whatever gender confirming interventions they desire. However, what I want to highlight here is the way in which these practices work to situate trans, intersex, and other gender non-conforming individuals within the logic of cisgendered life as normal, and the constraints it places on the gender and sexual trajectories of development available to all of us as sexed and gendered subjects. In the last 10 or so years, there's been a real surge in knowledge production about those with intersex conditions, particularly children, including genetic knowledge. With the introduction of the new treatment model for these conditions in 2006, the Controversial Disorders of Sex Development, or DSD treatment model, came an acknowledgement that the field of intersex management is plagued by a general paucity of evidence on all sides. There's inadequate clinical research or understanding of the complexity of sex and gender for clinicians to reliably predict future gender or to provide evidence-based recommendations regarding either the timing of surgeries or the surgical procedures to use. The treatment models available for kids diagnosed with gender dysphoria similarly suffer from a lack of evidence, be they the ones that support transition or so-called conversion therapies. Despite this, standard practice in both fields continues, as per usual. We continue to assign sex to intersex infants in infancy, thus the push to produce knowledge about uh, biology and gender of those with intersex conditions, as well as the proliferation of studies on trans individuals, and we can think here specifically about neuroimaging techniques, uh, <coughs> brain MRIs, but also genetic testing, particularly aimed so in the case of trans individuals so that we can distinguish those 20% of kids diagnosed with gender dysphoria who will likely go on to actually transition from the 80% who are diagnosed who will not. These studies are often positioned as beneficent and are justified on the basis of the notion that it is the interest of these trans and intersex subjects and their caregivers to have a better understanding of how it is that they are the way that they are, with the presumption of their presumably benign abnormality always in view. However, this research and the historical lineage of knowledge production about sex and gender out of and against which this research emerges is always already political. And we can uh, look to the work of our presenter for, for tomorrow, C. Riley Sorton, to really kind of bring that home. Indeed, we might think that this knowledge production regarding the bodies and lives of trans and intersex folks, particularly children, might in itself constitute a form of violence, even if MRIs, blood draws, and longitudinal studies don't seem all that invasive in the grand scheme of things. Indeed, we might want to follow Snorton in their assertion of, quote, a political and ethical imperative to the right to opacity End quote. And note that only some sex and gender beings and bodies require explanation, documentation, and bioscientific underwriting of their place in the order of things before we will allow them the kinds of rights typically afforded to humans, like autonomy, informed consent, privacy, bodily integrity, or other less juridically construed forms of freedom. Moreover, Insofar as, such attempts to, uh, insofar as such attempts to actualize a future in which visibly non-conforming lives are rendered unlivable, the subjects taken up by this research might have an interest in that research not being done. Indeed, the inclusion of children in particular in clinical research requires that we give, uh, or requires special justification given their vulnerable status especially when we're not talking about life or death situations like trials of cancer drugs, uh, and where we think the potential benefit to the participant themselves is likely to be minimal. However, pursuing such knowledge is used to bolster and refine treatment plans which aim at eliminating the development of non-cisgendered lives or ones that are visibly non-cisgender. 
then these subjects may have an interest in such treatment plans not coming to fruition, insofar as they may have an interest in a future that does not attempt to incorporate them into the logic of cis-normativity and constrain the sex and gender trajectories available to them as normal. All of this, of course, assumes that such research can, in fact, achieve its goals of providing us an understanding of sex and gender upon which we can make reliable predictions of future gender, based on, for example, your genetic makeup or a scan of your brain or correlations of that information with other biological and even cultural data. In my opinion, the hope that biomedical science can or will ever provide a reliable ground a reliable ground upon which predictions of gender can be made is a cis-sexist fantasy. Mm. Simply because something is biological doesn't mean that it is immutable. Mm. Indeed, we are so thoroughly nature culture that we are still exploring the depths of this entanglement. One need only look to studies of the epigenetic effects of intergenerational trauma on preterm labor, low birth rate, or infant mortality among black populations, or studies of the effects of certain, how certain social interactions can change testosterone production among quote-unquote normal men. Further, even if we were to grant the grossly simplified additive picture of nature culture underwriting so much of this research attempting to make sense of sex and gender, we would still have to grant the discrete and local nature of its outcomes, temporally, culturally, and geographically. Say it is the case for any particular child with an intersex condition or without one that their unique confluence of biological and cultural influences makes it probable that they will have a masculine or feminine gender. Whatever knowledge is gleaned from that case is not really applicable to any other child, let alone one who is born 10 to 20 years later, assuming you're actually waiting for a study to finish before we start applying that data. Those individuals will grow up in a differently gendered time and place. Everyone is an outlier. If we are honest about these points and about those prospects, then the notion of gender grounded in science and based in biology would make clear that gender is, or gender is not, and never will be either objective or administratable. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Um, uh, thank you so much for that. Um, it, you're making me think uh, it might shock some of you to learn that I occasionally spend some time on Twitter um, mm -hmm. and on other social media sites and uh, and in many ways often find myself in conversation with people who just kind of have a problem with the whole trans things thing and sometimes those people include uh, uh, people who, who describe themselves as feminists <laughs> Um, somehow have been unable to find the right theory to include me in the world. Um, and I, I hear that again, that question of, well, tell me what's the theory to explain you? Or tell me, you know, or tell me why I should accept you. Give me, you know, and there's, so there's this sense of to, it's, it's, it's interesting that, I, and to some degree I also see it's generational. Among my, um, uh, so I have a transgender daughter, who's 24, um, and when she came out as trans, um, her um, cohort of friends, people who were her age, more or less, reacted by saying, by saying, oh, wow, great, good for you. And in some cases, their reaction was, eh, okay, kind of indifferent. Mm -hmm. I know that when I came out as trans 20 years ago, I spent a year or more um, going to every person I knew and kind of apologizing, saying, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. Uh, kind of asking, begging people for compassion. Um, and some of the people that I approached in that way reacted in that way. Like, well, look, explain, explain to me about this. I, I knew a woman who, who, I was actually at a, a wedding reception one time with a woman, a trans woman, who was trying to explain to somebody, she, she had a, a color Xerox photograph of the, the so-called place in the brain that mm -hmm. then was explained why people were trans. The 
bed nucleus of the stria terminalis of the hypothalamus, the so-called seat of the endocrine system, which according to one tiny little study, um, it shows that trans, transgender women, who people who identify as trans, as, as women who are trans, um, have the same brain structure in that part of the brain as um, uh, natal women, as cisgender women. Uh, and her feeling being that only people would look at this colored Xerox, then they would understand that she was deserving of humanity and love. Um, and I, I just contrasting my daughter's experience and my experience, um, a lot of the people of my generation seem seem to want to know what's the theory. And I, I hear that reflected in what you're talking about, that what's the theory that explains you. Um, and in a, a younger generation, among some other people, I'm feeling I'm hearing a sense of we don't need a theory greater than love. Uh, we don't need a theory to I mean, my sense of, of the world is that if, if what you need, if your theory of the universe somehow doesn't ease the suffering um, of people who are are really at risk in this culture, maybe what you really need is a better theory or a new theory. That mention of the CDC that you the the, the report of the CDC, which you, which you mentioned, um, was in fact something that I. Um, uh, you know, immediately slid down the fire pole at the New York Times because that happens at the Times. You know, the, the, the alarms go off, and, and, and if there's something about queer people in the news. I have to slide down the pole and put on my my, my uh, transgender fire boots and write the essay. Um, I thought I would, before we go to the um, questions and answers here, just to share with you the last five paragraphs of that that essay. Um, I'm not sure this is. I'm certain this is not an improvement on what you said, but it is in some ways a conversation in response to what you just said. Um, I ended the column this way. President Trump and company should be prepared for the consequences of this decision to erase us because the people most likely to be disappointed in this glum new world will be themselves. They will be disappointed to find themselves if they are men standing in a men's room with me even though I have breasts and a vagina and a clitoris, and I do thank you for asking. In the new world that they're creating, I'll be right there in the boys' room with them, checking my bra straps and putting on eyeliner. You know, because of the white chromosome that they insist is the only gender marker that matters. Don't like this world? Well, you could have left us alone. Republican parents of transgender children will now find their trans sons and daughters endangered by freshly empowered bullies. How will those parents react when their vulnerable, frightened children come home in tears, or bruised, or not at all? Will these children make the choice of Leela Alcorn, who decided that rather than live in such a world, she would throw herself beneath the wheels of a truck don't like this world? Well, you could have left us alone. I have news for Donald Trump. I do exist. Trans men and women do exist. Genderqueer people exist. We've been part of this country for hundreds of years, since before the revolution, in fact. <clears throat> Redefining us won't make us go away. It won't restore your world to its precious, boring binary which, I hate to tell you, never existed in the first place. All it will do is make people suffer. Can any good come from this miserable moment? Well, I can hope that this will inspire people more than ever to fight back, not just trans people, but our spouses, our children, and our allies. And I might mention and uh, scholars, such as the, the two wonderful folks we've heard from today. Their numbers will also include people not unlike my late mother, conservative Republican women who just couldn't stand to see their children bullied by the one person in the country who ought to be most concerned with keeping us safe. Don't like this world? Mr. Trump, you could have left us alone. Okay, let's have a round of applause for our panelists. Thirty minutes. I think we can go over by five minutes. Is that all right? Okay. Okay. We're going to six oh five. Six oh five. And if it's six oh four and things are going well, I might go to six oh six. Yes. Um, we have a mic here, which I hope that um, we can pass around. Great. Thank you so much. So thanks.
Um, questions? There are questions. What, where do you want to begin? Comments? We're just going to wait you out, too. This is, this is going to be hard stuff to talk about, and I think sometimes people are afraid to talk or ask about transgender issues for fear of saying the wrong thing. Let's say that for the next half hour, we will give you absolution and make it possible that no one can say the wrong thing. And if you do, we'll, we'll jump on it. But um, let's hear your thoughts. We'd be grateful. Hello. Uh, it's great. Uh, There's a button you want to turn on. Uh, hello. It says on. Can you hear me? There you go. Okay. That's uh, My question is, uh, during actually uh, his introductory remarks, Professor Thomas mentioned, uh, I think he was quoting from something about the need when exploring the nature of gender identity to also reflect on uh, its relationship to racial identity. Um, I was curious what uh, reflections the speakers had in that regard, how racial identity or nature identity more broadly than the categories and forms our understanding of gender identity. Thank you. Let's collect uh, a couple of questions. I have a question over here, um, but I, I speak really loudly. Um, <laughs> one of the, the things that emerged as I was in the space between your two talks um, is some reflection on what we mean or what we might mean in the saying from an analytical perspective, uh, but also from a descriptive, a simple descriptive perspective, when we use the word violence. Uh, so, are you working, the two of you, uh, with a concept or with conceptions of violence that converge, are divergent, overlap in some spaces but not in others? Uh, because it seems to me that both of you were narrating um, and attempting to offer critical perspectives on practices that simultaneously could be understood um, as practices of violence, institutional and otherwise, but could also be understood using other kinds of language. So what work... Um, with respect to your individual projects, does the notion of violence, let's leave aside the, the, the adjective trans, gender or gender, what work in your projects uh, does the notion of violence do? Thank you, Professor. And I think that there is a hope that we can just add just a couple more questions to the to-do list here before we encourage our panelists to jump in. And yes, sir. I was wondering uh, whether or not you, um, I think, right, uh, if you um, try to, I, I saw some similarities between uh, your, your research and your study and the play of Sophocles and Antigone. Uh, I think it maybe it would be interesting approach, uh, try to compare these this two situations. I think uh, well, I was wondering whether or not you uh, thought about Wow, that is remarkable. Thank you. Um, we'll put that on the put that in the hopper. Maybe one more before we turn to our uh, our panelists. Over here. Two more way over here. Oh, there we go. Fantastic. Sit on. Okay. Uh, Slide up that button that says. Hello. Yes, there you are. You're on. Okay. Um. First off, thank you very much um, So I have two questions. One um, is about, this sounds weird. Is this all we're doing this? Just no, no, just Okay. <laughs> so, um, I'm sorry. I don't want to mispronounce your last name. Zengen? Yeah, Zengen. Okay. Uh, you discuss families organizing around the rights of their children, and would you mind elaborating on that? And then also, um, Clone Tick. Mm -hmm. That's a little easier for me. Uh, you were discussing the, the 
concepts between cisgender versus cisgendered, and mm -hmm. I hadn't heard of that before. Mm -hmm. So if you wouldn't mind elaborating on that. Thank you. All right, I think that's enough to get us started. Um, Austin, do you want to yeah. jump in? Or Catherine, do you want to be all? Okay. Do you want to go first? You can go ahead. <laughs> Uh, thank you for this question. So I'm just going to start with the last one. The, so first of all, I want to recommend everyone in this room to watch the movie My Child. It's a documentary with uh, parents of LGBTQ people in Turkey. Uh, so this is a small group that emerged in conversation, connection, association with the ongoing LGBTQ organizations in Turkey. Some of the parents had some kind of you know, emotional crisis, so they didn't know what to do, what to do with their feelings, what to do with their kind of transphobia, homophobia. So they started visiting individually these centers through their children. And then over time, a group organically emerged out of this parents. And they have been organizing for the rights of their children uh, since then. And this documentary is specifically focusing on this accounts of their transformation, how they arrive at a stage now they are at, and uh, w w what kind of crisis they had to deal with living in, 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 in their neighborhoods, in their larger extended families, in their social circles. Um, so it's an alternative account of like, how there's a different story of owning and intimacy and redefinition of sovereignty from familial perspective. But still minimal, I would say. Like the larger the common story is, uh, a, a story of uh, unfortunately oppression and discrimination. So the Antigone, yeah, I definitely thought about it, and then um, the larger framework I I, I work with this uh, funeral stories is actually. Like, to think about the connection between sovereignty and intimacy, which actually Antigone, you know, play portrays it in such beautiful and detailed ways. And Judith Butler wrote a whole book about actually Antigone. In, in her book, she also mentions the, 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 the redefinition and the conversations of sovereignty over mourning, over grief, what it means to mourn someone's death that doesn't, that cannot find a legible space in the social script. So how to, to twist the social script what to do with the social script by deforming, reforming forms of sovereignty. And so I definitely uh, find some kinds of you know, inspirations in Antigone. Um, but I also don't want my, my inspiration coming from Western, you know, <laughs> text. Like I, I'm, I'm finding my inspiration in other non-Western, you mm -hmm. know, spaces. But definitely it's, a, it's an important conversation um, and violence, I think that's a really important question. For me, violence is a social relation. It's not, um, I don't define violence as a binary category that there is a perpetrator and a victim. So a perpetrator always inflicts violence on the, on the victim and there's a recipient that part. This is not my definition of violence. Violence is another way of looking at social relations and how can we think about violence productively and creatively so when we talk about violence, this is, the story is a violent story, but at the same time there are all sorts of formations of intimacy, care, love coming out of this violence. So that interests me, how to think about violence in relation to sovereignty, in relation to intimacy, in relation to care, what kind of um, trajectories open up to think about the social in general, especially social at the margins of a society. Um, that's, that's, that's my approach to violence, I would say. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for all of these wonderful questions. Um, I'm also going to start the end, Rebecca. <laughs> so um, your question for me was about this kind of distinction between uh, cisgender and cisgendered. And um, it's a distinction I make. So I, I kind of introduced uh, thinking about I, I talk specifically about cisgendered futures or cisgendered lives. And um, and I do that for a few reasons. First, I think one's identity as um, cisgender is part of this, right? and it is uh, one variable that's kind of trapped within this 
um, kind of trajectory of development over time. So um, folks ever think of those like charts at the office or, or at the doctor's office that are like tracking birth and weight kids and they're kind of like a trajectory out like that. I kind of imagine something like that, but there are multiple variables involved here, right? So it is this kind of trajectory over time that is about maintaining what we think of as a kind of normative coherence. So the presumption that one will, in fact, identify with the sex they were assigned at birth, but they will also normatively present uh, as that gender. Um, and, and sexuality actually figures often in the literature as a big part of this. And I wanted something that would actually capture all of the variables that many clinical researchers who are working in this field are tracking. And um, they can be differentially concerned about different parts of it. So for example, there's um, an endocrinologist who works on major sex management named Maria New, and she often is very, very concerned about uh, what you would call gender role more than gender identity. She's really concerned about women being properly feminine. And often she talks quite a bit about motherhood and the desire for motherhood. And so, um, I wanted to get a sense, or, or really uh, highlight the fact that many who are working in this field are thinking far more capaciously than simply identity. And all of those different variables are ones which folks are being normalized with regards to, measured with regards to, and in a sense result in a kind of constraint of the field of possibilities as normal, right? Um, and I think in a way that also uh, serves to undermine and delegitimate the identities of those individuals who prefer to not conform to what we think of as kind of typical normative gender, right? I'm often thinking about, you know, what that there is a sense in which um, even within this, this kind of logic, you can see clinicians who, who think about themselves as very liberal and, and very, very um, accepting, but they're like, but we need to make sure that folks pass, right? The assumption is that everyone wants to pass, that everyone in fact should pass, that this is the only kind of legitimate gendered space for them to occupy. Um, and so I wanted to kind of be able to carve out and, and emphasize that aspect of what's going on here. Um, in terms of moving kind of back, and this question about violence um, is an excellent one. And, and I'm actually, thinking about these things in terms of violence is somewhat new for me. Um, but I think, uh, I would agree that I do think about violence as a kind of social relation. And here it is one that's about constraining individuals' possibilities um, and, and kind of the lives that are, are, are uh, whether we call them trajectories of development or kind of the forms of life that are available. But I also see something going on here in terms of the way that individual bodies are mined for data or seen as sites of data production by which um, both they but other future individuals as well can be measured and by which their lives can be constrained. And I would say I, I'm very um, indebted to see Riley Schultz's work on this. Uh, in his recent book, Black on Both Sides, um, I've been thinking quite a bit about the way in which certain bodies of those who are seen as abnormal end up being positioned as, uh, at, yeah, as sites of data mining. Um, and how we, we tend to not, or, or we tend to always kind of, always think about knowledge production, particularly in the biomedical sciences, as necessarily beneficent without actually thinking about the interests of those who are the subjects of the knowledge production themselves. Um, so that's where I'm with violence right now, but I'm, I'm working with it and, and kind of at the beginning of my, my play with it. And I would say the very last question, kind of over in the back there, um, about the relationship between race and gender. So I think I would say that, you know, Gender is necessarily a racialized category. Um, I think we're always kind of talking, we never really, even when we talk about gender and we don't say race or explicitly talk about race, it's at play there, right? And it's happening there. 
Um, one thing I will say is that I often don't talk specifically about race in relation to uh, the issues of intersex management, specifically because I have a real problem with the way that race is often um, operationalized in that context. Mm -hmm. So I would say that in discussions around intersex management, there's often um, a distinction that's made between uh, the treatment of intersex conditions within North America or among white communities versus those of kind of racialized others, and there's a way in which those racialized others are kind of positioned as um, as kind of backwards <laughs> in a way that I find really problematic. So, so you know, we might sometimes point to communities where there are very high, usually racialized communities that are very rural, where there are very high rates of intersex conditions, in part because of their um, rural and kind of geographic isolation. And then in those communities, you know, having an intersex condition in particular one might be very normalized because folks in the community just never happens. It's a very high rate. It's been there for a long time. Uh, and it's like, and, and those kind of communities will then be looked at, well, isn't that quaint? Uh, that's what happens when you don't have like high tech biomedical infrastructure in place and stuff like that. Um, but I would say uh, there are a lot of really great intersex activists of color who are doing phenomenal work right now. And I'm really excited for them to talk about the relationship between race uh, and intersex management within North America. Uh, and I'm kind of waiting for them to do their work so I can take my leave. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, you're making me think so, so much about, to me, the, one of the, the primary reasons why trans experience is um, so important to study is because trans experience lies at the intersection of so many other kinds of, or is connected to so many other varieties of oppression. Um, if you're talking about, if you're talking about transgender people, um, you're talking about healthcare, probably. If you're talking about healthcare in this country, you're talking about economics. Um, if you're talking about economics, you're you're talking about race, quite possibly. Or if you're talking about um, uh, about survival in this world, you're talking about passing. Um, you're also talking about um, whether people are um, employed, whether you can get hired or not. And so, for many transgender people, uh, the, the, one of the one of the um, biggest problems we have is not being able to get work. Uh, and this is true even, it's certainly true, it's certainly true if you don't pass, so-called. Um, but it's, it's also true even if you, even if you do pass. Um, I know so many people who've come to the final stage of a job interview and then they do the background check and, oh, we found out that you're trans. Yeah, well, that was 20 years ago. Um, yeah, well, sorry, uh, we'll call you. So, um, you're talking about all those things, but especially we're talking about race, because all of the uh, um, oppression, and in particular the violence, to circle back to where we began, seems to focus on people of color, and women of color in particular. Um, I, I wrote a piece, and I wonder, we, we're going to have copies of it originally made. Um, does anyone read? Do we have those? Can you just send those around? Are they? Are they're on the table. Oh, they're on the, okay, so there's, a, there's a, on the table up there. We made copies of a piece I published in the Times um, called um, Trans Deaths and White Privilege. And it talks about my experience uh, as um, a white lady at Barnard College. Um, uh, and, and, and so, and contrast that with day by day, the deaths of trans women throughout that year. Um, and um, I've been on the receiving end of violence twice in my, in my life. Um, but generally, I have um, been afforded safe passage that a lot of people, especially women of color and women and other people who do not pass, have not been afforded. Um, and um, that's, it's worth looking at and worth thinking about. Um, and it's, uh, we keep coming back to this question of passing. Passing as what? You can be, uh, I, was, I was attacked once before transition because somebody um, who, who saw a boy looking at me saw that I was the kind of boy who didn't fit in. So I was on the receiving end of, of, uh, uh, of violence on that occasion. And then uh, sometime later, post-transition, 
um, I was on the receiving end of violence because because I did fit in, um, and somebody found out that I was trans and felt like they'd been tricked. Um, so what have, what have we learned so far? They um, they come, they make our lives hell whether we pass. They make our lives hell whether we don't pass. They make us they make our lives hell when we're alive. And oh, as as I've just learned, they can make our lives hell after we're dead. So on that cheery note, <laughs> um, let's hear some more thoughts. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> right. I'm sorry, but that, uh, that odd sound. So thank you so much for um, both of your papers. And um, I have a question that sort of emerges between the papers, and so it's for either or both of you, which is a little bit about the distinctions between the North American um, context and the context of Turkey, and not assuming often that those terms are the same. And I'm interested in hearing more about the distinction um, around two themes that came up, which is one um, about um, terms of legibility and the goals either of pursuing or sitting within the terms of illegibility or a pursuit of um, autonomy over uh, achieving um, visibility. So one of my questions um, for you has to do with whether or not activism around those identification cards moves more in the direction, sorry, moves more in the direction of um, trying to remove color distinction altogether or towards more autonomy in the context of choosing the terms of which colored card you might have. So that's, and then the other term is question I have between these two contexts it has to do with how we define the intimate sphere and the distinction between the intimate sphere as determined in the context of the family versus the autonomy of the individual. So I'm, it's a sort of open-ended um, question about both um, the different goals of legibility versus clear forms of recognition and for how we define the terms of um, the um, intimate sphere within the North American context versus the context of Turkey, and also recognizing, um, um, as you just did, that um, the North American context is not a singular context. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you for your question. Um, I also want to start that Turkey also is not homogeneous in itself, and so there are different political projects going on within LGBTQ movements, and there's an ongoing conversation and contestation over, the, it's very similar to the conversations here, whether we are up for same-sex marriage or not, or so mm -hmm. whether we are going to be part of the norm or not. So that, that also um, relates to the institutional categorization of sex and gender, pink and blue, so there's certain ways of uh, desires and aspirations to be part of this particular norm to, to pass, as we just you know talked about a few minutes ago. But also there's another more radical project to just dismantle these binarisms and just open up a way to for more gender ambiguity, which actually existed before than, than and, and sex and gender became a kind of administration category. Um, so I would say they, they both go together and they keep reshaping each other, these political projects. Um, but also in terms of the political investments in legibility and visibility, um, since the political activism started focusing so much on particular forms of visibility around LGBTQ queer lives, it has also started attracting so much you know, attention from the police and from the state. So visibility comes at a cost of repression and violence, further violence, different forms of violence. So it's always a fine line to negotiate visibility in different publics. And visibility is not about just being you know, visible in all sorts of publics. So also politics around visibility is negotiating different publics at the same time. People are also organizing around this, like multiple publics, where to choose, where to choose the politics of visibility in which public and where to choose not. Um, so, for, for example, there are people who are not open uh, out with their families, but also you can see them on the street, just you know, for organizing around certain kinds of you know visibility, sexual and gender visibility rights with the state to gain. Uh, the kind of medical care, the labor you know, rights, the uh, 
normal citizen would have from the state. Um, it's not always an ongoing dialogue. Um, but I want to also add to this question, like when, I think in, in, on, in your research, also, there's so much family that also mediates the relationship mm -hmm. between the individual body and the science. So when we talk about science and scientific categorization of administration of sex and gender, especially when I think about like trans kids. Yeah. So how, for example, family in your case also intervenes into this mm -hmm. social world around science. So I'm also, as an anthropologist, <laughs> right. very interested in the stories of the social world around science. Mm -hmm. Not only as a kind of you know direct relationship between the individual body and the sign as an administrative you know body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just, There's so much I could say here. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and I'll start first by talking about uh, intersex kids, and then I'll move and talk a little bit about trans kids because I think the, the science stuff kind of works out, and and the the kind of the way in which the family gets caught up in this kind of social world is, can be somewhat different. Um, but I would say one of the fascinating things in terms of thinking about legibility and, um, and visibility in relation to intersex infants in particular is that the aim here is actually in <coughs> legibility, right? Or the invisibility of the intersex mm -hmm. traits, of a, of, a, of a kind of, you know, ensuring that these parents can take this kid home and say it's a boy or it's a girl, mm -hmm. right? And that, in fact, that kind of um, legibility um, within the family and within the intimate space is, in fact, uh, really the primary justification for all of these interventions, mm -hmm. right? That, um, you know, it was, it, it remains the case that the the treatment model for intersex conditions, even under the new disorders of sex development treatment model, acknowledges that the primary justification here is um, for the ease of parents, right? The assumption is that parents will not identify with or really love a child um, who doesn't fit clearly a male or female sex. Uh, and so that even though there's no evidence to support this whatsoever, and it will be said within the literature that there's no evidence that this is true. The presumption of most clinicians practicing in the field is that you just can't send a child home with, a, with ambiguous genitalia or who isn't clearly binarily sexed unless parents really push for it. And even then, they will likely get some pushback. Um, um, there are... Um, sorry, uh, George Ann Davis has a great book out called Contesting Intersex, where she's done interviews with clinicians and parents and affected individuals in the last, uh, I would say, last 10 years. And she has some phenomenal and horrifying quotes in there of parents who did push back on having surgery done and being advised that you know they should seek psychiatric care if they were going to try to make that kind of choice. Um, and I, I used to occasionally work with this pediatric urologist, we were the strangest kind of odd couple who we do grand rounds lectures together. And he would always say, you know, I can't send parents home with a kid like that. Like, how do I tell them how to raise that kid? And I'd often want to be like, dude, you're a urologist, I don't think they're coming to you. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's your purview. But to him it was really like unthinkable. And the problem was about this kind of, so the, social relations within the intimate sphere, uh, particularly because they were seen as like foundational to personhood, right? It was like, well, if your parents don't know who you are and they're not, they're not kind of raising you, right, in a gendered fashion, like you're going to be confused um, and likely ambiguous in some way, which again is then presumed to in itself be a problem. Um, I think within Within the field of kind of trans kids, it can work a little bit differently. And in part, it's because the field itself, I would say, is a little bit more fractured. So um, as it stands right now, the American Psychiatric Association, their position on what the correct treatment model is for trans kids is that they are agnostic. 
So they have no clear position, in large part because they cannot decide amongst themselves whether being uh, gender non-conforming in itself, in the absence of distress and social impairment, is a pathology. Mm. Okay. And so because of that, they, there is no clear um, guidelines on what the correct treatment is. And so it really will depend on the clinician that you see and what their personal beliefs are. And it also then means that the family's position has a, quite a bit of weight in terms of guiding care. So the way in which science is operationalized in that context can be quite strange, right? In part because it's like there is, um, there's no good research anywhere. So you can find kind of crappy studies on both sides, right, that, that are really supporting any position. Um, but if it's the case that, you know, the clinician and the parents are at odds, even if the clinician can kind of be like, well, if you're looking at these studies, they don't really have a ground upon which to say, like, this is, like, not standard practice, right, or this is not what we think of as, like, meets our norms of professional care. Um, and so clinicians, and I would say subsequently we're also in a position where parents will cherry pick clinicians mm. based on their own personal beliefs. And so it means you can get into kind of strange situations. So I would say that there isn't a clear, um, there aren't clear kind of general trends because of that. Um, but I think often the science is, in such a bad state, state that it can be cherry picked for whatever kind of position you want, which leads to chaos. It's kind of a wild west right now, I would say. And on that mysterious Western note, <laughs> we're going to have to let our voices fall. Um, I hope to come back tomorrow and um, uh, enjoy um, the continuing panels throughout the day, starting at 10 a.m. Uh, with uh, coffee and my freshness right here, and then our first panel at 1015, and uh, really going really right through the day. There are some amazing speakers. I hope you'll uh, join us then. We want to thank you for coming uh, tonight, this afternoon, uh, and let's please, one more time, um, thank and acknowledge our two remarkable scholars. Thank you.